Here's one. This is the SR Dagger. Um, it is about as long as, um, it's about this long. Uh, and they were carried sometimes, but not always. This is the SR. Um, here is Ernst Röhm, the man uh, who came up against the SS. And here is the SS Dagger, which you can just, in which you can just see, Meine Ehre heißt Treue. On the 30th of June, 1934, Ernst Röhm and several top leaders were at a, uh, a country retreat when they were arrested by the SS under the command of a man named Sepp Dietrich, carried out, and most of them were shot. They were shot because Röhm saw himself as part of this new empire, which Hitler um, disagreed with. Having proven their loyalty to Adolf Hitler, um, no matter what was asked of them, the SS began a rapid expansion into a separate arm of the German military. Let's go back to these mottos for a second. Alles für Deutschland means everything for Germany. It is the ultimate expression of patriotism, perhaps, for a national socialist German. It means that his priority is the saving of the German state. Meine Ehre heißt Treue is something entirely different. It is an expression of loyalty, but not to Germany, to one man. And that man is Adolf Hitler. That is why the SS, in their own minds, were able to carry out a massacre of their own national socialist comrades. The main branches of the SS, and there are several of them, are as follows. Not all became active until after the outbreak of the war, but it makes sense to mention them all at once so that we can begin to narrow down our focus. There are the first one, the most noticeable, the Hogan's Heroes version of the SS, are the Algemeine. These men wore black and highly polished boots. They were ceremonial in role. Uh, mostly uh, standing guard duty, available at all political functions. But they were not combat troops. Then there is the Sicherheitsdienst, also known as the SD, under the command of Reinhard Heydrich. Here he is. The SD was so well organized that many of the SS feared Heydrich as much as they would have feared any of their enemies. But they didn't have to fear him for long. On the 27th of May 1942, Heydrich was riding in a car in the Czech Republic near a town called Lidice. Commandos, Czech commandos, trained by British special forces, pulled up alongside the car and a grenade was thrown into the back seat where Heydrich was uh, sitting. The blast didn't kill him. What killed him and he died on June the 4th, so not long afterwards, was the fact that the horsehair stuffing in the seats was blown into some open, blown into his uh, body as part of an open wound, and he got, uh, got septicemia and died. In reprisal, the town of Lidice was more or less wiped out. Between hundreds and possibly thousands were executed in a pattern which was to be repeated many times in the years ahead. These duties were largely taken over by another group, the Army Intelligence, known as the Abwehr, under the command of Admiral Canaris, a man not trusted by Hitler and ultimately killed by Hitler. But what it did was disabled, more or less, the Army Intelligence Service after the SS Intelligence Service had itself had its own head lopped off. We then move into <coughs> the truly gruesome part of the SS, and that would be the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen were troops. I'll give you a picture. Here is a picture of an SS soldier. These men were mostly employed in Russia. They were special groups uh, following in the wake of the main advance in order to wipe out Jews, intellectuals, police, firefighters, doctors, lawyers, everybody in this room. Anyone capable of sustaining social order. The purpose was to render the remaining population completely helpless. The next group is the most notorious, but perhaps also the most difficult to pin down. They were known as the Totenköpferbänder, the Death's Head Band. This was a special division tasked with manning the concentration camps. 
The, di the reason they're difficult to pin down is that they were a very porous organization. People constantly rotating in and out. Army personnel, Navy personnel. Not a division in a sense that we would understand a military division. Not to be confused, and it does get confusing, with the Todenkopf division which was a tank division. There are going to be many such overlays in the minutes ahead, and I'll try and keep them all clear. The Waffen-SS was the main combat arm. It was by far the largest. Its numbers exceeded 900,000 during the war, and by the end, more than 620,000 of them had become casualties. Originally, entry into the Waffen-SS could be granted at the age of 18. Racial purity, by that it means German heritage, had to be established to the year 1800 for enlisted men and 1750 for officers. In the initial recruitments, no one under six foot two was accepted. That means if you're shorter than me, you don't get in. No cavities, which means I don't get in. Um, no acne scars, no scars of operations. They were trained in special camps, such as Bat Tolz in Bavaria, separate from other branches of service. On the outbreak of hostilities, the Waffen SS very quickly gained a reputation. See if I can keep moving through the pictures here. This was what a soldier would look like in color. It's a recreation, but it will give you a sense of what the Waffen SS soldier looked like, and I will explain the difference between this soldier and the regular army troops, not only in the way they looked, but in the way that they fought. They quickly gained a reputation for aggressiveness on the battlefield. I spoke to an American veteran of the 38th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division, that's the Indian Heads, who fought against these people in Normandy and also in the Bulge. He said that when they were attacked or when they attacked regular Wehrmacht uh, soldiers, that's German Army, they would usually do what most soldiers do, which is go to ground, return fire, assess the enemy's strength, and then either fall back or attack. The SS, he said, would always attack. If they came under fire, they would turn in the direction of the firing and they would attack. This might sound suicidal, but it isn't really. Those of you who might have found yourself in such situations, though, it's almost impossible to perfectly plan an attack when you have the, the uh, upper hand in terms of ground. No one ever has enough time to plan these things. The SS counted on that. They counted on the fact that an immediate, aggressive, direct assault upon any um, confrontation with the enemy would yield results, and it most often did. Quite often, very small numbers of these men, by making immediate attacks, were able to throw back in disarray those army groups which had expected these people to lock themselves into a certain area where they could be picked off and uh, reduced. They also looked different. They pioneered the use of printed camouflage. Every army in the world today wears camouflage more or less like this. Back in the 19, late 1930s, these were the only people using printed camouflage. In fact, their prints are, have been copied by such armies as the Austrians, uh, the Danes. Uh, many armies owe a direct uh, debt to the patterns of the SS. Here is what they looked like. And what's interesting is they came directly from nature. The most common pattern is known as oak leaf. In fact, it was taken from the sycamore tree. In Europe, it's called the plane tree. That is the bark of the sycamore tree. This is the oak leaf camouflage. It was extremely efficient and simple in its concept. They simply took something directly from nature and morphed it into their own camouflage. Later on in the war, SS soldiers wore this. It's known as a P pattern because it looks like little peas. Here is um, a very young SS man in Normandy with a MG42 wearing that camouflage. They wore no insignia on this, which often meant that they were shot out of hand because they were not wearing enemy insignia. Um, they were also quite often beaten up quite se uh, severely. This is a Canadian soldier with a young SS, uh, a young SS soldier.